Rahu. Rahu, you need a, a special award at the graduation ceremonies. You were the first one in class every single day. Michal, also. Danny, that's it so far today. Okay. Now this point we were discussing yesterday about the body and the soul, internal, external, Panemius and Chatsonius. Panemius means inward, essential. Panemius means essential. And Chatsonius means external from the Hebrew word Chutz. Chutz means outside. Like Chutz Lawrence, outside of Eretz Yisrael. This applies on all levels. For instance, we speak about a person having a moment of inspiration when the soul shines its light into your intellect. The highest point of your intellect is called Chachma. Good, you read my lips. Chachma is the potential of something to exist. So you have a brilliant idea, it's a potential. And it comes into your brain in that level that recognizes potentials, that's called chachma, and we call that in English wisdom. <clears throat> now, chachma goes together with Bina like a, a, a man and a king and a queen. A king without a queen, you hear this, Danny? A king without a queen is not a king. And he's not a king. He's not, and he's not great. When I was growing up, a teenager in uh, Canada, we had a prime minister who wasn't married. It was very strange. A leader has to have, a king has to have a queen. And this comes from the unification of Chokhmah and Bina. That Chokhmah is like a king and Bina is like a queen. Chokhmah is like a husband and Bina is like a wife. Chokhmah is the inspiration. Bina is the development of the inspiration into something significant. So the husband earns a salary and the wife spends it. And she makes all the decisions. What's going to be, you know, like the comedian says, my wife and I, we decide we take care of everything. I deal with the issues like if we should put sanctions on Iran, if we should support the European market, if, uh, if big things like that, should we put in, should we put a ban on nuclear arms. My wife decides little things like what curtains are we going to have? What are we going to have for supper? What color should be the, the, the carpet? All the basic things of life. So the husband deals with things up in the air and the wife deals with reality. That's the, the relationship between Chachma and Bina. Now Chachma being the inspiration. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Chagma being the inspiration <coughs> cannot come into Bina. How is Chagma going to relate to Bina? So Hasidus explains that Chagma has an inside and an outside level, it has an inward essential level, and it has an ex and a level that connects from its external aspects to that which is outside of it. For instance, let's look at it in terms of spheres. So we have the element of intellect, which is Chokhmah Bina Das, Chabad. Chokhmah Bina Das is, cannot come into your heart because your heart is an intellect. Your heart is a place of feelings. 
So your intellect doesn't go into your heart. What goes into your heart? A shine from the intellect. Good morning. <coughs> Shelly. Hi, Rabbi. In other words, your intellect cannot come into your heart, only a shine from your intellect, something external. Your heart is not a vessel to receive intellect. It can only receive, an intellect begins with inspiration. Your heart can receive an inspiration from that inspiration. Not something essential, but something external to it. When I was uh, in, in chemistry, in high school, we learned in chemistry about the structure of the atom. It's all outdated. Nobody believes in that anymore. But the way they presented it was like this. At the S, at the heart of the atom, you have uh, neutrons and protons, and then externally to, these, to this uh, core, the atomic core of the molecule, you have what they called electrons. Electrons are energy. And they said that the electrons, there are there's certain amount of electrons in the first ring, and then there's a second ring, it's like the solar system. And there's a second ring and a third ring, and according to the size and weight of the atom, so that's how many rings you're gonna have. Some atoms are very simple, like waters, H2O. And other, uh, elements are much more complex. So that the inner ring is basically like, I think two electrons in the inner ring, and I forget how many in the second and the third, you can look it up on Google. And a stable atom like salt is very, very stable. That's why salt doesn't decay and salt preserves everything. Salt is a great preservative. It doesn't decay and it, make, it keeps other things from decaying. That's why sailors going on ships used to take salted meat because it didn't have refrigeration. So that would keep the meat good for months while they were, while they were journeying. And that has to do with this week's Sedra because Kairat challenged the priesthood and Hashem answered his challenge by ratifying Aaron's right to be the high priest. And he made a covenant with Aaron and his children in salt. So there's always salt on the, on the altar because salt is an eternal substance, it never decays. So the Hashem's covenant with the priesthood is like this, a covenant made in salt, a bris, like baby boys have a bris that's made in their flesh. The covenant with the kayanim is made with salt. So that's why the salt is always on the altar. And every, what do you do with the salt on the altar? Every offering, had to be dipped in salt before it was put on the fire. And that's why we always have salt on a table. Whenever you have a table, whether you're eating or not eating, you have to have the salt on the table because the table reminds us of the altar in the base of Mikdash. When we bring our offerings to God. So when you eat, it's like bringing an offering to God. On the altar, we bring a sacrifice and get burned up as an offering to God. On your table, you bring your supper, you eat it, and before you eat, you say a bracha, and after you say a bracha, because you're going to use this energy to learn, to daven, and to do good things. So there we have to have salt on the table. And this has to do also, by the way, we're like digressing, you can see the Torah is so infinite. You just start on one topic, and it goes and goes and goes. Why salt? Because when Hashem divided, the rebellion of Kairach begins on the second day of creation, when Hashem divided the waters between upper waters and lower waters, this is the essence. This is the beginning of all division. This is the division of the waters. The upper waters, we don't even know what they are. It says the upper waters are above the heavens. I was never up there. What does it really mean? Hashem divided the waters between upper waters and lower waters. It was part of a process. We know that. He continued separating the waters on the third day of creation, and the waters receded into lakes and rivers and oceans, and the land appeared. 
Whether or not there was no land, there was only water over the land. Okay. So the lower waters came and complained to Hashem. How can waters complain? Good question. It says in the message, the lower waters complained to Hashem. They didn't want to be separated from God. And if Hashem is more revealed in the heavens, they wanted to be there. It's not fair. You're putting up our waters. We are, we are their brother, so to speak. We're water, they're water, they're up there. Why are we down here? Shem said, don't worry. I have special things for you. The salt that I'm going to get from your water is going to be always on my altarpiece in the holy temple. And every offering to me is going to be together with your salt. So that's why when you say I'm white, you dip the bread in salt three times. Why? Are we going to get the finish? I have to tell you this. Three times because the word for salt is, who knows what, how do you say it's in Hebrew? Melach. Melach is salt. Melach is salt. Forty, thirty, eight equals seventy eight. Good. Hashem's name is Yud Ken Kane five Bob six K five equals what? Any how much? 26. You dip the salt, the bread in the salt three times. Adds up to? Oh, so that's why we dip the bread in the salt three times. Okay, how do we get there? Shelly, what were we talking about? You were talking about salt. Melach, <laughs> <laughs> melach. <laughs> oh, okay, so quite, quite rough. All right. Quite rough wanted to be high priest, and Hashem made a covenant with, with the priesthood that, yeah, that's it. And now I got, I'm, I'm back on track. Hashem made the covenant with the priesthood in salt that it should be eternal. Kaira wanted to be high priest. He wanted to be high priest. And he saw every reason why he deserved to be high priest. So therefore he challenged Aaron and Moshe. And the Rebbe says, Kairat was a very holy person. Why did he make this mistake? The Rebbe says, the Rebbe says, everybody, says Moshe Rabbeinu also wanted to be high priest. What was Kairat's mistake? To want to be high priest, says the Rebbe, listen carefully, to want to be high priest is not a mistake. It's very admirable. That's something we can learn from Kairat. Everybody should want to achieve greatness in their relationship with God. But how do you achieve it? By, by submitting yourself to the leadership of Moshe. And by doing that, you draw the holiness of Moshe and Aaron down into the world. By challenging them, trying to knock them off, to take their place, you lose everything. Okay? So, <clears throat> what we were saying is that for Chochmah to come into Bina, Bina has to submit itself to Chachma. But Bina can't take Chachma. 
Bina can only take, oh, here we are. We were talking about the nuclear atoms, right? So there are atoms that have, here's the core of the atom, that here's the core of the atom, here's the outer ring that have two electrons. And here's the second ring that have I don't know how many. And the third ring can have I don't know how many. Now, let's say I don't know how many there are. You look it up on Google, you'll see how many electrons are. Here there's four, second ring, 16, third ring, and maybe you have two, only two in the outer ring, but these have 32. So this is going to look for another atom that has a lot of spare electron, a lot of electrons, and these two can flip off and join a second atom to make a molecule of two atoms at the two and the other that they go together. I should really look it up, review my, my great nine chemistry. The point is, it's the outermost, it's the outermost electrons that are not so held so well, that they are the ones that get away and can combine and complete the outer circles, the outer, or outer orbits of a different atom. Or like this, you look at, uh, uh, I once did some research about the sun. The energy in the sun is tremendous over and overwhelming and it never leaves the sun. It remains in the sun the whole time. So what comes in the window? What's the sunlight? The sunlight is a sun energy that escapes from the sun. In other words, the sun is so powerful that it sucks everything into it. So it's just constantly burning, burning, burning the whole time. Never, never burns out. Never goes out. The sun. What escapes the sunlight is just what escapes from the outer, outermost levels. So similarly, the outermost, external, most external level of Chachma is what comes into Bina. And the outermost external level of intellect is what comes into Midois. And in terms of your soul powers, you have the essence of the soul, I need to get rid of all this. We have the essence of the soul. And then we have from this, coming from this, we have the powers of the soul. And from this, we have the garments of the soul. So the garments is very, very far from the essence. Now, in the struggle between the Yetzer Toy, so the godly soul and the and the animal soul, the Yetzahara. Nefesh Elokis, the godly soul. The godly soul in a tzaddik. <coughs> transforms the Yitzhahara into a Yitzhahara, overwhelms it. But in a Bainani, it cannot over, overwhelm the essence of the animal soul. It can, in, in a Bain, this is in a Tzadik. But in the Bainani, Nefesh Elokis can only overwhelm the soul garments, the garments of the soul. But the essence of the soul remains what it is. It remains unmoved. So that when the Nefesh Elokis is very strong, and the garments, the Nefesh Elokis is revealed very strongly in the garments of the soul, which are threefold garments of thought, 
speech and the action. <coughs> then the Yetzihara is knocked off. But, but when this when, when the love and the godly soul dies down, then the Yetzihara comes comes back and seeks to express itself once again in the garments of the soul, because this is where the, this is the arena of conflict. This is where the godly soul never shall have peace. And the animal soul really are fighting it out the whole time. In the Benini, the fight goes on every day. If the if the never shall have peace ever wins that fight, for good, it's not a Benin anymore. It's not. And if the Nebuchadnezzar loses that fight, even one skirmish, when he loses, he becomes a Russia. He becomes a wicked person. Because the wicked person, by definition, is a person who goes against the will of God. That's why he's a wicked person. The Benini never goes against the will of God. Why is the Yitzhadik? Because he's fighting with the Yitzhar the whole time. The Tzadik isn't fighting anymore. The tzad, by the Tzadik, the war is over. The Tzadik is taking care of everybody else. It's like the shepherd taking care of the sheep. Okay, that's what we had, we're learning yesterday. So we have to know when a teacher comes to teach a class, when a father comes to teach his child, he's not gonna, when your professor comes to teach you a very deep subject, he's not gonna teach you the deep depth of the subject. You'll go to sleep. You won't know what he's talking about, right? He's gonna tell you a story. He's gonna tell you a joke. He's gonna sneak in a little bit of information here and a little bit of information there. And gradually he'll build up your knowledge base until you can deal with the idea a little bit on a deeper level because he can only give over something from the outer readings. He can only give you external bits of knowledge, uh, a shine, a glimmer of what's by him. So what's an image of this that the Hasidus gives an image a father loves his child, father, very wise person, man of influence and success. And he comes home and he gets down on his hands and knees to play with his young child of a, a year or two. And he makes funny noises. He makes, he plays with his little child. Where's all his wisdom and knowledge and experience and power? He's giving over the child on the child's level. Something very, very, you can't go to a big business meeting and say and, and talk to them like he talks to his two-year-old. He talks to his two-year-old with all his heart because he loves it. You see? So that's the difference between essence, internal, and external. The essence of the soul and the garments of the soul. Never shall look his, can only in the vain control the garments of the soul, thought, speech, and deed. And the essence of the soul. The Yetzahara, the animal soul, remains unmoved. In the tzaddik, the essence of the soul is transformed and becomes another Yetzahara, like in chess. Anybody play chess? When the pawn gets to the end of the board, it becomes a queen. It's not a pawn anymore, it's a queen. So the Yetzahara becomes, or she is the Kala. <laughs> All right, we're just talking about Bina. And my companion S is here, and Nicole is here. All right. So therefore, after the, the what happens 
after the person finishes davening, the lights go dim and <clears throat> and the Yetzirah returns to plague this person with, with inappropriate thoughts and desires. And so that's why he's a Benini and not a Tzadik. Page 187. Page 187. Where it says 17 to pages. Okay. There's an impression that even after this, even though the lights have dimmed, there's still like an afterglow. Like when you go to the theater, if you go to the theater and the lights are on, then the lights go off between the acts. The, the lights go dim as the as the actors leave the stage, and then they come in the meet, and before they come up to the next act. The next scene, there's still a, an after, there's still a light on the stages. You're not, it's not completely dark. So similarly, in your mind, the fear of Hashem and the love of Hashem are still there, but in not in full full force like during the davening. But there's an after an afterglow from them, and this afterglow is a not. It's called natural love. In every Jew, we said yesterday, when you go to give candles out on Friday to some lady, that, that awakens the natural love in the heart of a, of a person. And this enables him, and this enables him to, enables the person to rule over the uh, Yetzirah, which is suggesting all kinds of things all kinds of desires in his heart. That the Yitzhahar should not prevail, should not have rulership here in the city, which is his heart. That the desires that he has will not cause him to do, to act. He will, will this, this afterglow of love remains in his mind as an, an intellectual love of God and fear of God that will keep him in check. Like the reins on a horse, keeps the horse going where the rider wants it to go. You know, the horse has, has tremendous power to go anywhere he wants. <clears throat> the reins keep it in check. So the afterglow of love and fear in the mind of the Benini keeps the desires of the Yetzirah in check that they don't come out as action the garment of action, and they don't express themselves in speech. You don't, you don't speak in anger. But in terms of thoughts, uh, thoughts, he keeps pumping the eights, and the eights heart keeps pumping these thoughts into you. Okay, so this will prevent the person from, from realizing the desires of his heart, that is to say, from the left side of his heart, it's not just his heart, you see, that's what people say. If Hashem didn't want me to behave like this, he wouldn't have made me with these desires. Since Hashem gives me these desires, that must be okay. If I like things that are, the Torah says I'm not supposed to, the rabbi says I'm not supposed to do this, but my, my, my body tells me I should. So what's wrong with that? Hashem made me, must be okay. Uh-uh. Hashem made some people with a desire to steal. He made some people with a desire um, to light fires in other people's property. He may have made some people with desires to look where they're not supposed to look and to hoard what they're not supposed to hoard and to do things that they're not supposed to do. And that doesn't make it good just because they have the desire. On the contrary, that's where they show their character to make a choice not to do the wrong thing. That shows character, okay? And not just in, in, in action and in speech, but even in what you think. Here's Torah, yeah. Thank you, Torah. So even what you think, page 187, second from the bottom. Even in a person's mind, 
Levadoi alone, Mahar <clears> Herbera, <throat> to think about doing something bad. <clears throat> The Yetzir Kai, the godly soul in the Benini, will struggle that he will not, should use the word, entertain. I'm not going to invite in an evil, a bad song. It, oh, it knocks on the door, and it get, like the, the encyclopedia salesman, he knocks on the door and then puts his foot so you can't close it on him, close it on him anyway. That's the struggle. So even in the realm of thought, in the Benini, where the struggle is taking place, he doesn't let the thought in. He leaves it outside in the rain. Ein Shlita, the Yetzirah, does not have the power, the control, the dominion, Memshallah, his dominion, Lahar Her Hasrashalam to think, and the Alter Rebbe adds these words, heaven forbid. It's not just an, it's an idle thought. It's the Alter Rebbe, there's no such thing as an idle thought is a sin. <clears throat> a negative thought is a sin. The Benini will not entertain, will not invite you. Go, come in, come in. I haven't seen you in a long time. Come in and make yourself comfortable. Can I get you some tea or some biscuits? Have a seat. No. The HR says, that's a bad. The HR says, that is an undesirable thought. You don't invite it in and you don't let it stay and you kick it out. If you can't get it out, you call 911. Call Hatsala. Get this evil thought out of there. How do you get an evil thought out of your head? I have a strong desire to do something that I was brought up never to do it. My mother said, I never should play with the young boys in the wood. If I did, she would say, You'll only end up in the family way. My mother taught me this was a bad, bizarre thing to do, but I want to do it. Everybody else is doing it in my class. It's a class party, everybody's doing it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That shows character. You don't let the thought, you don't entertain it, you don't let the thought in. She says the altar Rebbe, this is has for Sholem. Is the same, heaven forbid, like killing somebody or stealing or doing any other dastardly thing. You don't invite evil thoughts into your brain. How can you get them out? They're so strong. Answer, think of something else. You can do it. You can do it. You can think of something else. If you got a telegram from home that mommy was sick and been rushed to the hospital, you would rush to be with her. You wouldn't think of anything else. She has heaven forbid, she that with a with a strong you're willingly going to invite this thought into your head. head. Has for Sholem, he says a second time, has for Sholem, heaven forbid. This hero horizet, this hara, this evil thought, it came up from nowhere, from your heart, on its own. It made its way up like a, some kind of a bug. The other day I was sitting on my bed, learning, and this bug walked across the bed. Was I was very upset. Maybe it was a bed bug. I we hate bed bugs. You have to defumigate the whole, all the furniture and everything. I was very, very upset. I couldn't think right. So this thought comes rising up like a bed bug into your brain. May a love automatically just seems to get there. Comes me may halev from the heart. From where in the heart? We know from where in the heart. From the left side of the heart, right? Not the right side of the heart. From the left side of the heart, the thought rises up into your brain. Page 188. Umiyad. And immediately, as soon as you recognize, oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you were enjoying this thought for a split second. Hanabina, you were enjoying this thought. 
and, and you recognize that, wait a minute, wait a minute, my mother said I never should. Think about these things. So what do you do? You push it away with both your hands, like you push an unwanted visitor out the door. Push him out the door. We don't let, I gave him the office, thank you, goodbye. Close the door. And you, you think about something else. So, so there it is. There is the answer right there. In this wonderful, extraordinary, a fantastic, unbelievable chapter. You, you think about something else. Miyad, instantaneously. As soon as Shaniska Shahu hear her right, as soon as you come to your senses and recognize that this thought is inappropriate, we do not in, accept these thoughts in this yeshiva. We don't let them in into this cheder, into this Sunday school, into this Talmud Torah. We don't let these kind of thoughts in. You have a complaint, take it to the principal. You don't let them in. We do not accept any such thoughts willingly, happily, great, graciously, kindly. It's not an act of kindness. It's the opposite. It's a disruptive element. He's that this class, this thought is going to disrupt the class and it's going to prevent other good things from happening. Afilu Lahar Boy so therefore, the Yetzir Toiv, the godly soul, is not going to allow this thought to remain in your mind willingly. Well, how much more so, it's not going to allow this thought to take the next step from being in your mind, which is to urge you to do something about it. He is not going to uh, think about doing it. It's bad enough that, he, that, it, that it made its way to the brain in the first place. Well, says, a third time, he says, Chas v'sholem. So three times in one sentence, the Al-Prebbe has said, heaven forbid. Heaven forbid, and heaven forbid, and heaven forbid. Oh, I feel the Dabra boy, and how much more so he's not going he's not going to think about doing it, and he's not going to speak about it either. He doesn't have to say heaven forbid. He already said it three times. You know, that's heaven forbid to us. Because... Because a person who willingly thinks about something that's not appropriate is called a wicked person. At that time, he is the wicked son of the, of the Haggadah who says, what do you mean by all this? Not me. I like this. No, he's a wicked son. And we don't want to be the wicked son. We want to be the wise son or a simple son. Or the son doesn't ask. We don't want to be the wicked son. We don't want to be gender exclusive. So we don't say wicked daughter. Prejudice. End of the chapter. We finished. Almost. Now comes the clincher. We learned all this philosophy about the essence of the soul and the garments of the soul. <coughs> what does that mean to me in my day-to-day -day life? Okay, fasten your seatbelts. This is the roller coaster of life. As soon as you think you understand a good idea or you achieve a certain control of the way you want to live, comes the gates of Sahara to challenge you to see if you really need it. You know, like that story I told you yesterday about the young man who came into the house with all these candles, the shama candles, and he's, should I take, should I not take? My, my own life is at stake. He's going to take some life from somebody else. He says a lot. And the, the old man comes and says, I thought you were looking for the truth. So the gates of Sahara comes to challenge you. Are you really looking for the truth? When it comes to your own puppet, is that what you're really holding? Or is it just a nice thought? So that's just the das, 
when you connect to the thoughts with thoughts, with knowledge, then you live with it. I remember reading in a book long, long ago before I ever knew what Shabbos was about an, an Indian, an American Indian, a native Indian who was teaching this uh, foolish PhD candidate what life is all about. So the, the PhD candidate took his Indian, his wise man, what do they call him, the magic, what do they call him, the, not a witch doctor, you know, the wise man, the Indian tribe. what? Shaman. The shaman. Uh, well, there was an English term for it. Anyway, he takes a shaman to hear some big philosophy professor and says to him after, he knew what he was saying about it. He so said, I think he didn't know what he was talking about. So the whole time he's smoking a cigarette. The wise person doesn't need to smoke cigarettes. That's what he said. Because his uh, wise ideas did not connect with the way he behaved. So now, <clears throat> Comes it's hard to see if you really know what you're talking about. And now Rebbe says, if your, your das is working, you're connecting your ideas to your heart. Das connects your ideas to your heart. Remember that. Write it down in your brains, write it down in your notebooks. Das, like in Chabad, the, 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 the D in Chabad stands for the connection between your mind and your heart. There's a story that um, Sigmund Freud, a psychologist, met the Reverend Rashab at a, at a health spa. And he said, I have a problem. My, my ideas are too big for my feelings. And vice versa. The Reverend said, well, Hasidus lays cables. Those were the days of the cable, undersea cables to make telephone calls from Europe to America. We lay cables between the mind and the heart. That das is the cable. <coughs> so now comes the clincher. Page 188 at the bottom. So too in matters between man and man. Okay, the class is officially, oh, we didn't finish, tomorrow we're gonna to finish the chapter. Just a one, one short paragraph left. Thank you very much for being here.